Let's read about it. Start reading with me and you can follow. I mean, I'm going to read and you listen, okay? Don't read. It'd be pandemonium with all the different versions. But starting in verse 13 of James 4, listen to these profound words. Remember, I'm reading not, uh, you know, the Tulsa world which can change. This is the infinite, changeless, inspired word of God which has power just in listening to it. We can be blessed. Come now, verse 13, you who say, today or tomorrow, we're going to go to such and such a city. We're going to spend a year there. We're going to buy. We're going to sell. We're going to make a profit. That's the ultimate in this freewheeling, uh, do-it-yourself, confidence in self lifestyle. Now, there's nothing wrong with planners and planning and, and making a profit and being in business. There's everything wrong with only living for that. Look at verse 14. Whereas you don't know what will happen tomorrow. What's your life? It is even a vapor. Great description. I mean, try and catch a vapor and hold it. You know, it's gone. Try and grab your life and say, I'm going to have it next week, next month. You can't. It's a vapor. It appears for a little time. It vanishes away. Verse 15. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now, you boast in your arrogance. What's that? Boasting in today or tomorrow, I'm going to do this, I'm going to make a profit, I'm going to have this, I'm going to have that. That's boasting in your arrogance, in self-centered living. All such boasting is evil. Remember, this is a letter to the church. It's not talking to those greedy, you know, uh, corporate um, people that are just fleecing the, the world back then. No, 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 no. He's talking to Christians. Look at verse 17. Therefore, to him that knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. Okay, let's look at the first point. Look at verse 13 with me. Number one, the purpose of my life is not to gather money. I shared this with a man on Thursday. I said, you know what? Most men know more about their financial position and their, where they are financially than they do about their spiritual standing before God. Uh, most men know more about their investment strategy, their, their pension or retirement or 401 or their own business they own than they know about how they're racking up eternal dividends. Most women are more concerned in our country about whether or not they're going to have what they need than whether or not they're going to have something to give to Christ at his throne. I'm talking about the church, coast to coast. That's why Jesus said that the day is coming when, when the church is going to be just paralyzed because they're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, but they know not that in God's sight they're poor and naked and wretched and miserable and blind. What does that mean? They're, they're coming empty-handed before Him. He sent us down here to gather up for His kingdom eternal dividends. And instead of that, we're picking up everything else. And we're holding on to things that, that we can't take with us instead of grabbing what we can. Jesus preached a sermon on this. Why don't we turn back? Don't lose James, but turn back to Luke. That's the third gospel in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, in chapter 12. And Jesus preached the most profound sermon, and it only took about 40 seconds. I mean, now that's, that's true divinity, I'll tell you. When you can say so much in 40 seconds that, that no comment is needed, let me just read it, okay? Luke 12... And this is Jesus' opinion of someone who lived only for money. And it's loud and clear. Luke 12, starting in verse 16. And this is what Jesus said. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease. Now that's the, that's the cry of, of America's retire. I mean... Do you get all those things in the mail? I mean, all these retirement planner things. I didn't know I was old enough to retire or to even plan for it. But I get them all the time. 
And it's saying, did you know that 30% of all the baby boomers don't have more than $10,000? And did you know that 30% of all the pre-retirement, 51 to 61, don't have more than 10000 Are you going to be part of this, this penniless group that are not ready to take their ease? And, and As if the whole purpose of life was, look, look back at that verse. Verse 19, so I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Is that the purpose of life, to lay up as much as you can so that you can take your ease and eat and drink and, and recreate and amuse yourself and be merry? Verse 20, but God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things which you have provided be? Who's going to take all your barns of stuff? You know what Jesus is saying? I, every time I read this, I hear the same thing. He's saying, buddy, you built your barns too big. Don't build your barns too big. This man spent all this time getting bigger and bigger and bigger barns. And he was so busy building more barns for his stuff that he lived life only horizontally. He forgot about God. And that's what he says. Look at the last verse. So is he who lays up treasure for himself. That's something God condemns. Make sure that the treasures that we're all laying up aren't for ourselves. That, God said, is wrong. But look what's right and is not rich toward God. You know, there's a way that you can have much and have it count for God. And there's a way that you can have it much and count for only yourself. And God says you're truly, desperately, infinitely poor if you have big barns full of stuff for yourself and you're not rich toward God. Well, back to James real quickly, because that's what James is saying. He says, come now, you who say in verse 13, today or tomorrow, we're going we're gonna to do this. We're going to go to that city. We're going to spend that amount of time. We're going to be involved in this business, and we're going to make this profit. And life is reduced to finances. And someone's value is reduced to finances. And someone is, someone's worth in our sight is reduced to their financial setting. How much they have, how nice they smell, how good they look, how poised and polished. That's something uh, I so enjoyed, and Bonnie and I have reflected. What, what a wonderful, wonderful time it was having the, the provost with us. Because all we talked about is that land so different than our own. I'm not talking about heaven. I'm talking about Eastern Europe and Russia. Because over there, the greatest people are the poor people. Did you know that? I've stayed in homes that had dirt floors. I stayed in homes where they had absolutely nothing, where their clothes were tattered, where they were patches sewn on top of patches. And yet they were the most radiant people. They were people that had only pieces of the Bible. They had only pages of the Bible. And those people over there had, as Bob said two weeks ago, they were forced by the government to not have an education, forced by the government to not have a pension, forced by the government to not have a good job, and forced by the government to not be able to, to be involved in all the cultural activities. So what did they have left? The best. God. His people, his word, his church, his kingdom. And they were rich toward God. And they were also happy. And the people around them were slitting their veins and cutting open their stomachs because they had nothing to live for. And they had everything. In our country, we're rich and increased. In fact, we ought to turn there. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot one verse. Look at Revelation 3. Jesus finished his sermon in Revelation. So, so go to the end. And I want you to see how the rich man with his big barns gets moved into the church. And Jesus finishes his sermon in Revelation 3 and verse 17. And, and uh, he... Well, I'll start in verse 14. This is to the last church. Remember, the, the churches in Revelation were, number one, literal churches in the first century. Number two, they're portraying the ages of the church. And number three, they portray individuals that are in all times in every church of Jesus Christ. So there's a threefold meaning to this. That's the wonder of God's Word. It's not only a historical record of a church in a city called Laodicea. It's also a time era, which I believe we're in. It's also naming the types of people that sit in every church that have sat in every church for the last 2,000 years. But look at verse 14 of chapter 3. And to the angel or the messenger of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen. That's Jesus. He's the Amen, the true one. The faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works. You're neither cold nor hot. 
I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. There's no way you can get a positive spin on that. I mean, that's negative, okay? Uh, that's, that's awful. And so there's, this, is, this is about the worst thing that Jesus can say about his church, that I will vomit you. Uh, awful. Look at this, verse 17. Why? Why, Lord, are we sickening you? Why are we making you ill? Why is it that you want to dispose of us because you're irritating your stomach? And, and why is it that you don't want us? Because you say, I'm rich, I've become wealthy, and I don't need anything. And you don't know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. See, one is how we see ourselves, the other is how he sees us. Look at verse 18. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. For as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous. Repent. I stand at the door. I'm knocking. Let me in. What's he talking about? Well, back to James chapter 4, verse 13. That's the end of his sermon. But I want to pull it together. What Jesus is saying is, and what he's talking about is, he says, the purpose of your life here on earth is not to gather money. I mean, did you catch that? He's saying that. He's saying, if you're spending all of your time figuring out how you can save more and pay less for this or that, and how you can have more stable investments, and how you can increase your dividend, and how you can have so, so that you can not only send your kids to the right schools, but you can retire early, if that's where you're consuming your energy and you're working all that extra time so that you can produce all that, he says, you're not living for me. And we need to think about that, because that's where America is right now. I mean, we have, we have enough... We have more than enough for the whole world. We could, our country could feed the whole world. We could clothe the whole world. The Christians in this country could fund ministry to the whole world. The whole world. If we weren't so concerned about ourselves. And he's saying, the purpose of my life is not to gather money. 